certainly one of the key elements of the permafrost network is the training of the next generation, educating the youngins out there to see uh, how we can further the science and the engineering as we go forward. And uh, so whether it's traditional knowledge or scientific endeavors, I think everybody would agree that learning from the people that came from before you is very important. And uh, so that's what we're going to do first, is have this keynote panel with a couple of the people that uh, are, well, our most senior, but our most uh, uh, prestigious uh, permafrost scientists in Canada, uh, Chris Byrne and Tony Lovkovich. Um, and hopefully we're going to get to share in the wealth of wisdom and experience that they have. So I'm going to uh, start the discussion with a few questions and uh, we'll see what they have to say to those questions. And then we're gonna do a uh, second part of this is gonna be breakout rooms for a little bit so that we're gonna just randomly throw you all into breakout rooms where you can talk about uh, briefly what they, the, what the answers they came up with or the uh, things we didn't touch on and uh, come up with questions of, uh, for your breakout room. We'll get uh, one person to write down the question in the chat. And then when we all come back into the main room, we'll, we'll send the questions to them that are from everybody else uh, in the meeting. So I don't know if I have to really do much in the way of introductions for these two people because everybody knows who Tony and Chris are. But I'll quickly say, Chris Byrne is the Chancellor's Professor of, in the Geography and Environmental Studies Department at Carleton University. He previously held the NSERC Northern Research Chair. He was presented in 2018 with the Polar Medal by the Governor General. Uh, he's volunteered extensively with the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and he's currently the President of the International Permafrost Association. So he has the credentials to say the things he's going to say. Tony Lovkovich. Um, is a professor in the Geography, Environment, and Geomatics Department at the University of Ottawa, where he's also, he also held the position of Dean of Arts for six years. He's the former editor of the journal Permafrost and Periglacial Processes, one of our premier journals, and former president of the International Permafrost Association. And of course, as we heard earlier this uh, week, uh, he was the founding president of the Canadian Permafrost Association. So, gentlemen, thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, I'm going to launch right into questions so we don't waste any time. So I'm going to start with you, Chris. Um, simple little question. How do you see the uh, field of permafrost science evolving over the next decade or so? Well, thank you, Brian. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Tony for joining me on this uh, elders panel. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I, I, I'm not in a position to think that anything that we're doing at the moment is unimportant. Uh, and so I'm, I, my comments are not going to be associated with new directions where we need to drop everything that we're doing at the moment and go off into a new field. But I do think there are some areas uh, at the moment uh, that we need to concentrate on in ways that we haven't been concentrating uh, effectively, I think, effectively enough. And, and the first one it concerns time, and that is that uh, people are now concerned about what may be happening in the next 30 to 40 years, or even the next 10 years. But very rarely, when we produce our indications of what the world may look like, uh, and quite often these are presented in rather catastrophic and dramatic language, very rarely is anybody willing also to bet their house that this is going to happen. And it's not going to bet their house or even bet $5 that in 40 years time, you'll have to pay me back $45. Many of my graduate students have paid me uh, bottles of whiskey when their predictions about when they're going to finish their graduate degree <laughs> has not come true. Uh, and I would say that one of the things that we're not very good at is really having a strong sense of time for many of the things that we're predicting to take place to actually take place. Now, we know that uh, with simple analyses like the Stefan solution, things occur quickly to start with, and then they tend to slow down later on. The question of when critical change will take place or will have taken place 
is something that managers in this country need because if they have a time frame they can manage they can manage the resources that they are required to deploy but if they have no time frame if they're simply told well this is going to happen in the future it is pretty close to being useless because they don't know whether they have to deal with the problem now whether they can prepare to deal with the problem in the next five years or whether in fact it's a problem that's in 15 years time when somebody else is going to be looking after it and so they don't really need to deal with it at all so the the question of time and how time is going to play out not just in terms of the events that are going to happen but in terms of the frequency of the events that are going to take place, I think is an area where we need to spend, a, we need to put some effort into giving people horizons which are reliable. And I haven't yet seen, um, even though we do have some um, data from the last 10 years, I haven't yet seen a good accounting of where people have made predictions and then determined if those predictions have actually uh, turned out to be the case. So one of the areas I think we need to spend a lot of effort on is time. The second area that I think we need to spend considerably more, more attention to it is to do with the peculiarities of space. And that is that we all know that local conditions can be very different from the general condition. Much of the time when we, uh, pr when we produce um, evidence or when we produce predictions of what's going to happen, it may be done on an engineering basis on a site specific uh, basis, or in some of the high profile journals, we indicate what's going to happen the world over. In between those, there's very little attention to what's going on at different scales. And yet it's the local conditions which characteristically inform us about how the environmental system is operating because it's the local conditions that combine together in particularly uh, unique ways in different locations. In addition, they work through history. And so the, 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 the time component is not separate from the spatial component uh, and, and leading to each location having, particularly, having a potentially different future trajectory. Now that is a very difficult thing for, for people to get their head around, but it's a, it's a fact of environmental science. Uh, and so the, the question of the emphasis between understanding imminent processes, those are processes that we are, believe occur everywhere all the time, and what is a configurational issue uh, is one which has been acknowledged in the environmental sciences for about uh, 60 years but is not one that I think at the moment uh, we are paying sufficient attention to. And it's one where if we are to be useful to people in the future, uh, we will have to pay a great deal of attention to. Good points, Chris, very interesting. Uh, Tony, did you want to uh, respond to that or add yes, to it? Sure, sure. I think, uh, I mean, as usual, Chris has come through with a high level erudition, which is unmatchable. Um, so um, I'm, I'm in the difficult position of following him. Uh, and of course, he's raised the bar intellectually by talking about these two big questions of time and space, um, which I definitely agree with. You know, following up on the space question, um, I used to say you could fly a long way over the Arctic islands and never see a thaw slump. Um, I think that's actually still true. Uh, but if you choose the right locations to go to, you can see hundreds of thaw slumps now, which were not there previously. But even taking Banks Island, which is, you know, the, the highest concentration, I think, of thaw slumps anywhere in, in the world, it's only about 15% of the island that's being impacted. So 85% of the island, you, you won't see a thaw slump at all. Uh, so clearly space matters and conditions matter. And associated with space, the biggest challenge, I believe, is that what is really making those environments different is what's under the ground. And so ground ice is fundamental to the way the permafrost landscape and to the way ecosystems are going to react in the future. And that has been an enormous challenge for us. Uh, Brendan O'Neill and, and Steve Wolf and others at the Geological Survey have come up with this recent uh, ground ice map of Canada, which I used in, in, in a presentation that I gave yesterday. And it's the best we have. It's certainly better than what we had previously, but we know that it still can go a lot further. So that's, that's an area where we, we know we still have to work. But coming back to the, the first point that Chris made, which is time. And uh, 
I believe that we can be thinking about this in another way, not just in the multi-year way, but the intra-annual fashion. Um, for many years, uh, researchers did their work in permafrost areas solely in the summer. And by that, I meant after snowmelt and before freeze up. So there was kind of a six week window, perhaps an eight week window. Ross Mackay was one of the big exceptions to this uh, because he recognized back in the 1960s and maybe even the 1950s that you should go uh, to really understand uh, permafrost environments. You need to go there in the winter time too. But for many people that has been extremely difficult. Um, so we are hugely under-researched in terms of actually not just the winter, but also the freeze up period and to some extent, the spring period too, all the hydrologists have obviously always gone in in the spring. And you learn a lot by being present in the field and just being there to see what happens. Um, the end result of that is that we're only just starting to see some very important uh, processes that are happening outside the summer. And there've been some recent uh, papers, for example, the one on uh, carbon and, and methane emissions during the freeze up period. And uh, I was slightly um, amused actually, that uh, in one of the presentations or one of the comments that was made in the permafrost carbon network meeting last week was, oh yes, we were looking at, and do you know the active layer didn't freeze up sometimes until December. And I thought, well, yes, we know that. We've known that a long time, but the ecologists had not put that together, partly because they left the field when freeze up began. And we're now seeing that that's a very important period. So I'm not, I hope I don't sound like I'm mocking ecologists because I'm not trying to do that. But rather what that shows is too few people have been doing that work. And one of the reasons for that is the academic year which means that it's hard for professors to be in the field. It's hard for graduate students to be in the field after the beginning of September. That's one reason. And a second reason is logistics. It's hard to operate, uh, to be able to make observations in uh, through the fall period into the winter period. It can be dangerous. It's certainly challenging no matter what. Well, that brings me to the second point, which is that in the future, I believe we're going to see more work done. I think it's going to be important work and we're going to see new things happening, completely new things. Uh, Steve Cockell has uh, a video of the ground moving up and down in the fall that was completely unknown until, we, until he, he actually observed it using a time-lapse camera. Uh, so I, I'm sure there's unknown unknowns uh, 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 that we will discover uh, through being there. And then how are you going to do it? Well. That means places like Chars are gonna be really important. Places like Eunice in Svalbard are really important because they can be bases under which observations can be much more easily made all the way through, uh, through the different seasons. And links to Northern uh, communities and indigenous uh, individuals who will help, who can be trained. We can develop better Northern capacity. So we're gonna need better links into the North. So those are a couple of thoughts that, that I had. I think time is going to matter through the seasons, uh, understanding the seasonal responses as we move into an environment which may be surpasses, as Duane said yesterday, the last interglacial. So as we move forward, things are going to happen that we don't haven't seen in the past. And they're not just going to happen in the summer. They're going to happen in the other seasons too. Good points, good points indeed. Um, I just want to pick up on something that uh, sort of both of you alluded to, and that's this this change is happening, that's that's going on, and and you know that's is one of the things that makes permafrost so interesting, is that you know if you're studying southern geomorphology or climatology, climatology for that matter, um, it doesn't have this element to it that we have to deal with, and that's phase change, right? With the warming climate, we're going from a situation where we have permafrost, where we have solid water in the ground, and it's turning to liquid water in the ground. Um, do we need to do a better job of pursuing un our understanding of that and, uh, and or communicating that to Southerners? Uh, well, I, if I could respond to that relatively uh, in a short fashion, I think one of the interesting things 
is that as as Tony acknowledged and you have acknowledged also, Brian, what I mean, we hope we owe this massive legacy to uh, Ross Mackay. But in the last few days, I've been thinking particularly about uh, things like cryotubation and the formation of hummocks and uh, the origin of the ice rich zone at the base of the active layer, which is what we would call aggradational ice. But when Ross was making his observations, the ground was in a state which is rather different from today. He could actually assume that he was looking at an equilibrium model. So he could devise an equilibrium model of hummock formation, which is published in 1980. I don't know if we could say that the ground is in equilibrium now. And so some of the understanding that we have and which we is part of our day-to-day -day thinking uh, is associated with what it would now be considered to be a special case, which is the case of equilibrium. It, it's just though that we, in order to understand how an environment works, it's much easier to start thinking about it as being an environment that's in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And from there, start to think about what happens as, 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 na as nature changes. But as, as Tony pointed out in his, in his uh, comment about ground ice, it, in a sense, ground ice is the history of the, of the permafrost because ground ice is there because of what's happened in the past. Ground ice is very rarely manufactured over the course of a year, or if there is some that's manufactured over the course of the year, it's a very small amount in comparison to what, with what is there actually at the present time. So, so in, and yet surface temperatures respond more quickly than the quantity of ground ice that is, that is in the ground or the, the temperature in permafrost responds more quickly than that. So one of the things that we have to match out is, is the different timescales that are involved in what goes on when we change the ground and how we think the ground is changing. And if we don't have any particularly good idea of what are the ground ice, what is the ground ice content or context in a particular location, it's very difficult to predict how that location is going to respond to whatever change is imposed on the surface. In an equilibrium situation, we might be able to deal with that because in an equilibrium situation, we think that the ground conditions don't actually change very, the ice conditions don't change very much because it's in equilibrium. But now we're not in an equilibrium condition. And that's why I think that we have to pay a huge amount of attention to the history of a, low, of a site because it's the history that has given us the ice. And it's the ice that is going to, to inform how the site will respond in the future. Good points, good points. Tony, did you want to add anything to that? I think it's, um, it's, it's the biggest challenge of working in permafrost is the, the time lags that ha are, are there between the climate and what happens in the ground. And those lags are not only difficult to ascertain, but they're also very variable depending on the conditions in the ground. And communicating that element in particular um, and building it into models, say at the, the national or global scale, is where these, these the, it's, it's the biggest challenge as far as I'm concerned. So it's hard to say to a reporter, well, we know this is going to happen in the long run, but we can't exactly say when. And, uh, you know, it could be anything in the next 20 years or the next 50 years or the next 80 years. Uh, in other words, you, it might be your children, it might be your grandchildren, or you might be pushing up the daisies before any of this is going to happen. And uh, politicians, uh, you know, translating that into policy, well, politicians work on five year time frames at the longest. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the state change is what makes our field so challenging when in theory the physics is so easy it's just heat flow but in practice figuring out the time and space of that heat flow is really uh yeah that that's the ongoing challenge for all of us but i think i think tony's point is incredibly important when we think of trying to print make global scale projections of what's going to happen because ground ice is not a global scale phenomenon it's a local scale phenomenon and so when I read projections that we've now got rid of permafrost from the Hudson Bay lowlands uh, in, you know, on an annual, on a, you know, on a, in a global scale model, it makes me think that there's something fundamentally wrong with that conceptualization of what's going on. And characteristically, it's to do with applying 
equilibrium thinking to a transient problem. And that's what happened in that particular case. And in addition, another thing that I think we should be very careful about is where we produce demonstrably incorrect data. So if we produce a simulation, which for example, grows a lot of permafrost in Saskatchewan, Southern Saskatchewan, rather than saying, oh, this is very good, we should start scratching our heads and wondering like, what is going on here? And I don't think we do enough of that sort of, um, of, of collection, a critical collection of our own ideas, because quite often it's, it's in, in, the, in the, the case that Tony has, has described, if we don't consider what's happening within the ground in a physical basis, which is a difficult thing to do when it's variable, if you want to do it at large scale, it's actually very easy to make some embarrassing blunders. Yeah, good points. I was gonna, I was going to ask you one more question before we went to breakout rooms, but we're running out of time already. Oh my goodness! Um, and that my question was going to be, you know, what's more important, the field work? Both of you guys have long, extensive records in doing field work, or the modeling that we see uh, talked about so much these days, or remote sensing, that kind of thing. But I think it's easy. It's easy to answer it, Brian. We need all of them. Yeah, exactly. Right. You just made so I, I mean, we need the we need the but. I think if, if, if I could encapsulate maybe what we've been saying, I, I think what we're saying is that we need good field observations and those are backed up and expanded upon. So local observations that are expanded upon by remote sensing. And then we need the models to project for the future because only models can project for the future. But those models should be tested thoroughly using the data that we've gathered about change uh, through observations in the field. Um, yeah. And if th those three are uh, three, three legs of a tripod and uh, in the middle, there's something that's going to go up when it's based on all three. Good point. Good point. OK, I want to turn it over to everybody that's in the audience right now to have a chance to come up with questions. Now, we've got 73 people uh, participating, so I don't think we have time for 73 questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw everybody randomly into breakout groups, breakout rooms of, I don't know, four to five people type of thing, and have you uh, talk amongst yourselves for, what do we say, Michelle, 10 minutes? About six to seven minutes, so it's quick. Okay, so amongst your group, come up with a question that you want to pose. Um, that's the, the, actually the very first thing you do amongst your group, decide who's gonna write the question into the chat and then come up to have a discussion, come up with the question you're gonna pose. And then um, we're going to come back to the main, we'll haul you all back into the main room. And um, once we do that, start typing the question into the chat, but don't hit return. Um, what we're gonna do is when I say hit return, we're all going to, you're all gonna hit return at the same time. And all the questions will come up at once, and then we'll figure out which questions that we want to pose to Tony or Chris. Okay. The, the second question was a really good one, Brian. Hmm. Change of state. I think it's. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it, that's it, something. It, could, it could be a theme, right? You could do a whole lecture on that. I do in my class, actually. I, I've been really thinking about that a lot lately. If you look at rates of change just from a landscape evolution type of thing, you know, when everything's cold, everything goes slow. When everything's hot, everything goes fast. But when everything goes over that, zero degree, degree, it's orders of magnitude faster change to landscape and everything falls apart. But it, it slows down so much before that change happens. That's the, yeah. the tricky yeah, part. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it really is a, a uh, two-sided pulse. Welcome back, everybody. The person taking the notes or writing the question, oh, don't hit return yet. <laughs> <laughs> Write it into the chat, but don't hit return. <laughs> You get one minute to, to type, um, and then we want to see all the questions come down at the same time. And then uh, and then we'll give a couple minutes for people to read them and scan them, including Chris and Tony, and then I'll start picking out some of the ones to ask. Okay, everybody hit return. Here they come. Okay, awesome questions, everyone. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to turn to Chris and Tony. Are there any One's right off the bat. I've got a few favorites picked out already, but do, do you see any ones right off the bat that you want to, are itching to tackle? Uh, Brian, you make the decisions because, uh, you know, we could answer all of them. 
Okay, so they're uh, all great questions, and I don't think there's almost any overlap between them. Yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, it'll be it's great that we're capturing this uh, this this uh, chat because uh, for all the grad students out here, this is an important thing to look at if you're looking at what the future of permafrost is. These are some of the important questions. Okay, I wanted I want you guys to uh, tackle this one first that uh, Trevor's group had uh, addressed. And it's how do we address the biases introduced into modeling by professionals of different backgrounds? And you could say modeling, but you can see, say, any aspect of science in that, right? We're now getting more ecologists in, soil scientists, and all kinds of climatologists playing in our permafrost field. How do you how do we address those biases that people have? Well, I think the, the first and the most important thing is that we need to establish what you might describe as the basics in a curriculum. So th there are some things which um, everybody who studies permafrost needs to know about, which is like, how do ground ch temperatures change over time? There are some things about how does ice occur in the ground and what happens as ice melts in the ground and th or thaws and, as, as ground thawing takes place. There are, th there are elements like that, which um, because of the particular situation we're in at the moment, which is that lots of people have all in, in mid-career in some cases, have moved into permafrost as an area of their research. They've, they've missed out on the um, re requirement that almost every profession has, which is that you should have some basic common education. So that's one of the things I think we need to do is to create common education that everybody could have so that we all know that we, we're doing the same thing. It would be inconceivable for me to say, well, I've decided that because there's lots of money to be made in medicine, I'm now going to become a doctor and go and start practicing medicine. I have to do a lot of common training before I can do that. Similarly with engineering, I have to do a lot of common training before I'm allowed to be an engineer. And so to suddenly become a permafrost scientist with no background in any kind of common training is, it seems to me is opening us up for problems. And people will say, oh, that's easy to do that because it's just something that people learn about in geography departments. So you can find about it, anything that you want about it on a map. You know, that, that's, the, that's a little bit of the mentality that is, that is being brought in here. So establishing a common curriculum, a foundational curriculum, I think will make a big difference. Good point. I agree. And uh, the CPA, uh, one of the goals of the strategic plan is indeed to develop some uh, elements of, of course, courses are taught perhaps within universities or as short courses that are going to, that would improve that. Um, and then we need to make sure that everybody takes them, of course, and make money out of them. So the CPA benefits as well. <laughs> I but, strongly but, support that coming from a, a department that just did away with our permafrost course because we wanted to do more global change courses. Um, so, And there are very few across Canada, and that comes back to Chris's point um, that uh, this is a field that is hot, <laughs> terrible pun, but uh, it's hot, uh, and that has meant that we have a weird demography in the field. Um, Brian referred to Chris and I as the senior members, but we shouldn't be. There should be a whole bunch of other people who are our age or older and in the next 10 years, and there are very few. Yeah. And uh, as a consequence, we have a demographic gap in the field. Uh, that means that the, the sort of standard pyramid structure of experienced professors, less experienced professors, all having graduate students and so on, that doesn't really exist to the same degree in Canada as it probably should. And that's one of the reasons why permafrost net is so important actually. So we can develop yeah. that proper demographics. Um, let's go, go on to the group 10 question um, because it leads right from that. And that's, do you think permafrost science will continue to be supported by Canada or do you think the support will plateau or decline? Um, you know, it's all hot now because of climate change, but is this going to continue? Um, I, th I would say uh, I'm going to get this one first and just say what, what I think Chris would say, which is that unfortunately, the COVID ducks will eventually uh, fly off. And um, that means that the, the end result will be that the federal government will be forced to uh, deal with a major deficit. And uh, when this happened back in the 1990s, uh, the uh, end result was that federal government spending declined. Uh, there were big changes across the board. I would foresee that happening somewhere down the road. 
but I don't think permafrost will be singled out for this. This will just be a general, uh, a general retreat in the area of funding for science, scientific research, uh, because the government will feel that it has to do something. And I think there'll be cuts across the board. So I'm a bit pessimistic, but not in relation to permafrost itself. I think that the field has achieved a high enough profile in these last few years. And uh, if the Minister of the Environment says permafrost, oh, that's a problem, then I think future ministers of the environment will continue to do so. And we'll also see those problems uh, become magnified in any case, so they'll be increasingly evident. I'd just like to add one thing to that, uh, and that is that um, in uh, the 1990s, when these big cuts happened, the workforce in the federal agencies was relatively mature. And so it was possible to uh, pension people off. And quite a lot of people took early retirement and disappeared. And when there are less, fewer people working in the agencies, then clear on those particular topics, then of course the topics decline in importance within the agencies. Now we're very lucky at just at this moment in time that within the Geological Survey of Canada, we have some young bucks and uh, young buckesses who are working there. And so they can't be, we, they can't, we can't get rid of them because they just won't be able to retire because they've only been working there for three or four years and they don't have a big enough pension. So they will keep them. And that means there will always be a strong voice in the Geological Survey of Canada. Similarly, with what's going to happen in the NWT Geoscience Office, there will be a number of young people who are hired in, in that organization and they will have a momentum of their own. So there will, there will be a stronger voice for permafrost research in Canada in the next 10 years than, than would be, um, the, than, than, and, and one that we can't get rid of. Like, it's not gonna be possible for people to get rid of these people um, and, and move them off into other, into other sectors. And so that is one of the sort of perverse insurances um, that we have uh, in, in this, with respect to this question. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good point. Hopefully the government just doesn't lay them off completely and send them out on the welfare rolls. But, uh, you know, um, no, I can't see that. I can't see that happening. No, no. no it's it's too it's too important. The, the subject has has um, it's risen through the coffee cup. It's now the cream on the top. So uh, it's kind of visible. Well, that's good to hear. That's I good think to the, hear other, the other thing, Brian, is that um, slowly, slowly, we're being we're beginning to appreciate the magnitude of the cost that this again this this um, thawing permafrost is going to impose on public infrastructure in the north, and when when the government incurs a large amount of money for something, then characteristically they want to study it, because because there will be people who are saying we shouldn't spend money on this, and there's other people who say no no we have to, and so it becomes something that within the government system is is of interest. And what that what that means is that that trickles down to to other other agencies. So I don't see that the polar shelf, for example, will get closed down. I I, I can't see the support for the Aurora Research Institute suddenly evaporating. I can't see support for Yukon College or Yukon University evaporating. Uh, it's that there are some institutions that are now here. They they may not be supported at the level that they have been supported in the last two years but there, there will still be fundamentally significant support. And don't forget also that the population of Canada is going to continue to grow because that's what the government wants it to do. Yeah. And if the population continues to grow, then, then in some sense, there will be more interest and there will be more um, revenue coming into the uh, federal and provincial coffers. Good point, good point indeed. Okay, let's change direction a little bit here to look at some of the other, one, other uh, questions. Um, and I'm reading this one from, oh, I lost it, uh, da, 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 where it goes, oh yeah, uh, from Kate's group, and they're uh, asking on this idea of, of uh, scale and time, um, and your comments about that, what advice would you give to engineers with respect to the management of time and scale um, in an engineering context, so not just a scientific context, but when you were talking about engineering? Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll have my first uh, crack at this, and this may not be very popular with the engineering community when I say this, 
Uh, one of the things I find the most curious about engineering projects is that effectively after one year, the construction company and the design company can walk away from the project. And that is that the warranty for the project is for one year. And then after that, the owner assumes responsibility. So I find this to be very strange uh, because if, if I were a, an owner, I would want to know that my, my uh, project is gonna last for a, a lot longer. So I think the time scale question is one that is going to become more important. And I think this means that the, uh, the amount of precaution that is going to be required uh, is increases. And so if, if you think of it in simple terms, the sort of factors of safety that are going to be required are going to, are going to be uh, increased. And also the risk assessment that is uh, that, uh, that takes part in is that is part of any design um, uh, uh, any design basis for a project will become a, a larger component of the project uh, design. And I think it will also be something that owners will want to actually uh, participate in rather than just being told uh, what the results what the results will be. The second thing I think that is going to happen uh, in terms of engineering is that there will be um, a, re a recognition that site conditions uh, require site investigation and uh, that future uh, infrastructure behavior depends on site conditions. I, at the moment, site conditions are part of the uh, site investigation is part of the capital cost of the project. And the capital cost is something that almost every developer wants to minimize. And therefore, site investigation is something that gets minimized. I think what people will do is realize that they require considerably more site investigation. And they also, on the basis of site investigation, may actually change the location of their infrastructure so that it goes to a site where there is much less risk because there's much less ice in the ground. So those are the those are two things. I don't know, Kate, if that actually answers your question, but I, I think I think the the, um, the the question of risk assessment is going to become more important, and then the question of site invest then the act site investigation activities are going to become um, more more. Uh, they're going to be required to be more thorough. So I I want to follow up on that because I think there is there are two uh, engineers are usually building something at a particular site. So in that sense, they have an advantage over scientists who are usually trying to expand beyond the site at which they're, they're interested in, um, where they're measuring something. So they can, if the big problem is ground ice, well, you can drill boreholes because I want to build it right here that needs to be built here as a tailings dam or whatever it is, this is where it's going to be. So that, that makes life somewhat easier for engineers compared to scientists who may be trying to uh, model across a landscape or decide what's happening across a landscape where the ground ice is, is heterogeneous. I'm not saying it's easy to be an engineer, by the way, but, but at least you know, or you theoretically know what the conditions are. But in terms of time, um, as Chris says, you know, we're building structures for a certain period of time. So I, I would imagine sometime in the future, we are, a, an engineer is gonna be confronted with the following. We want to build this structure here, whatever it is, a dam um, or, or some other feature that's on the ground. And then in the site investigation, it turns out that climate change is already causing permafrost thaw at that site. So now what do you do? Do you try to hold it off by cooling whatever it is you're putting in? Knowing that that thaw is going to continue, do you try to accelerate it? How are you going to deal with a site where the, na the natural conditions, that is the anthropogenically in influenced climate, is already causing thaw to occur? And I don't think, uh, the engineers will correct me if I'm wrong, that we've really confronted that, that question, but it's going to become more and more common. It's not going to happen instantly across the permafrost world. It's going to happen in a kind of the wave that moves northwards as the climate warms and as permafrost locally thaws. So at the site level, that's one challenge. Linear infrastructure is an even bigger challenge because you're gonna go across all these different conditions where you cannot do the same level of site investigation and where time again and thawing of permafrost is not gonna happen uh, uh, all at the same time, but be spread out depending on the subsurface conditions. You know, one of the other things, Brian, that we can be satisfied with is a lower service standard. 
uh, and that that's a way of managing things you just fix it up as we go along and if there's a road then you just maybe you have a lower speed limit on the road uh, so that's another way of handling uh, something like this it doesn't quite work as well with pipeline now no um, you know some of the themes that have come out in the last uh, two and a half days now have been you know the importance of dealing with not only the science but the policy people um, also this scale thing that you've been you've been addressing and uh, finally the issue of data do we have enough data can we draw on other people's data it seems to be recurring over and over again um, maybe this is one of those areas where we can actually combine those to actually make great advances i was lucky enough way back when I was an undergrad to participate in the research along the Norman Wells pipeline. And it was one small, well, I don't know if it was one small comment, maybe there was lots of behind the scenes arguments, but when they were doing the approval for the pipeline, somebody went to the water board, Alan Judge went to the water board and said, you know, not just this one year of data collection, I've seen lots of abandoned uh, thermistor cables all around the Arctic where some engineering thing was created, done, and then after a year, they stopped monitoring. So he said, instead of one year of data collection to the end of the warranty, we should build into the monitoring process or build a monitoring process into the lifetime of the, of the pipeline. And so as a result, um, that was one of the conditions to make the pipeline is they had to continue monitoring. We ended up with this rich data set that spanned hundreds of kilometers along this pipeline that is now out there, as far as I understand, it's in GSC open files, that people can now access all this uh, temperature data so that we can use it for other science projects and, 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 and uh, increase the, uh, the data richness we have in the models that we create and that kind of thing. Okay, so, uh, Brian, can I ans answer one of the questions that's there? Choose one that's sitting here, but I, uh, if I may just answer, it's from Shannon. You bet. It's, you, it's, what areas of permafrost would you focus on when trying to get started? As grad students today, if we were, um, first of all, I'd feel younger and fitter. That would be good. Uh, with the current knowledge, what might you try to focus on? So here's my answer to that. Something that interests you. The worst thing you could do is develop an expertise in an area which you don't care about. First of all, you probably won't finish your thesis. And secondly, if you do, then you're going to be working in an area you don't care about. So um, I don't have, <laughs> that was a, a kind of useless answer, but I think passion matters. And actually the three of us, uh, Chris, Brian, and I, I think we're passionate about our discipline even after all these years. And uh, that really matters. It comes across in, it, it gives you credibility because people see that you care. Yeah, it's very true. Um, you know, in a discipline such as uh, permafrost science, where it's not only applied, but it's so applicable in so many areas, we don't have to worry about whatever we choose in this area to being relevant. You know, I've got anthropologist friends that, oh, nobody cares about monkeys or whatever it is. Everything we can, we choose to do is going to be relevant. So choose what you're most interested and passionate about, for sure. As my mother said to me after getting my master's thesis, well, dear, I don't really understand any of it, but you seem to have had a good time. <laughs> We've got a couple minutes left before break. Uh, did you want to say a couple uh, concluding remarks? Chris? Uh, well, I'm always uh, happy to have a concluding remark because that means we're getting near the end of our time. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that I echo very much what Tony has just said. And that is that it's very, very important to find something you're interested in. And if you're interested in, in you know, things will go. I, there was uh, somebody I heard who complained at once to Ross Mackay that he had answered all the easy questions. And therefore, the rest of us had a very difficult job to do. Well, this is complete rubbish. Uh, the questions that Ross was answering were as difficult for him as the questions that we answer, that we ask ourselves today. Uh, he had a different knowledge base upon which to, to build on. Uh, but. But in going back to him, I would say that one of the things that I think we, we do need to do is, um, is think about uh, how a, a career of 40 years, which led to such prolific productivity, uh, can now be only rarely cited in the literature when we're working on something that he worked on. So if we're, for, for example, if we're working on the active layer today, it's very unusual 
to read a citation from Ross Mackay from the 1970s or the 1980s, even when that material is directly relevant to the, to the item that is under discussion. And, and one of the things I would urge everybody to do is, is to spend less time on social media and more time reading the scientific literature, especially the one that people think is a good uh, scientific literature to read, because it may take a bit of time to do that. And I remember reading the, the secondary frost eve model of, um, uh, from Bob Miller. It took me three hours to read six pages of a permafrost conference paper. But at the end of it, I had it. And, and that was three hours of intense effort, but it took me, it, it, it changed the way I thought about Frost Eve. And it's that kind of investment of time that I would urge you to, to spend uh, because in the long run, it's really worthwhile. And just remember that the messages that are coming in will be gone tomorrow and people will have forgotten about them. Over to you, Tony, any last words? I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I think my last words are actually just follow up to what I said earlier, which is that, you know, science, you never have the final answer. Um, and, and that is particularly a challenge as a graduate student, which I think we were partly meant to do on this, this, is, this panel was to think about that. You know, you're forced to stop at some point and write it up as a thesis or write it up as a paper, even though you haven't necessarily reached the end of the line. But that doesn't stop you using your curiosity to think about what would be the next stage and maybe even moving it on even after you finish. So I, I would say, you know, follow your, follow your ideas um, and don't stop uh, just because you've had to for a particular purpose. Uh, the, the best students that I've had have been naturally curious and that comes back to the question of passion. You're curious about something that you're passionate about. So yeah, that's it. And that results in great longevity indeed.